ominous. I, I thought that was like intro music or something, whatever that, I'm not sure what that was, an airplane, Pastor Troy's breakfast, I don't know. But uh, hey, Matthew 11 is where we're gonna be in just a minute. And right before we jump into Matthew 11, let me just add one word uh, to something. Yesterday was a, an exciting day here at Cedar Park. It was our Cedar Park Christian School graduation uh, for both our Linwood campus and our Bothell campus. And uh, you can see our Bothell campus graduates there, good looking class of 2022. And uh, we say congrats to each of them. It's a wonderful day, what a, what a great class, great graduation ceremony. Earlier in the day was our Linwood campus graduation. You can see the class of 2022 from our Cedar Park Linwood campus. Uh, congratulations to each of them. What an exciting and, and adventurous year, uh, school year this has been. And so if you were a part of the class of 2022, you're gonna have some stories to tell your kids and grandkids about the kind of things that you went through in the, in the years of your high school. But uh, we, we're excited and, um, and we wanna just acknowledge what a great day, such an amazing day. Great staff, great teachers, great, I mean, just in, in many ways, even though there's a week left of school, that's kind of a finish line for a lot of people. So I remember the last week of school after the seniors were gone, when you were like a junior or sophomore, wasn't that like the best week ever? You're like, we don't need those guys anyways. We rule the school now. You know, um, no, it's, but it's, it's a wonderful week. So we wanna do this. I just, I say it as a means of this. If you're older, that means you've graduated, you've gone on to do different things. You remember how excited you were during that moment of graduation. It was the greatest accomplishment that you had made really up to that point in your life. And you also know how many things that you've been able to accomplish since then. And I just say this, would you be in particular praying for the class of 2022? Praying for the class of 2022. In a few weeks, we're gonna have a, a prayer service for all those who are crossing lines of graduation, but be praying for them in particular. This is a challenging world for young people to try to find their way in, especially young people who wanna live for Jesus. And so uh, be praying for the class of 2022, be supporting, look for young people that you can come alongside and mentor and, and help encourage uh, in ways that you can learn from them as well. Cause there's, you know, everybody needs to figure out how the new uh, operating system on their phone works. Ask somebody who graduated in 2022, they'll help you. Anyway, okay, congrats class of 2022. We're proud of you guys. Matthew chapter 11, did you find it yet? Okay, so today, as we've mentioned, is Pentecost Sunday, but we are in our series in the book of Matthew, and uh, we're looking at, at Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 this morning, and they tie uh, just amazingly in with this theme of what God is doing uh, through the Holy Spirit, how God works through the person of Jesus Christ to bring all of his goodness into our lives. Uh, this is an interesting story. There's some background and context to it. Uh, we're going to read about John the Baptist, who is in prison. Uh, John the Baptist, and there's no explanation of it in this particular passage, but John the Baptist was imprisoned for his firm commitment to the truth. John the Baptist was committed to speaking truth regardless of the consequences. John spoke the truth whether people were gonna like it or not. From the beginning of his ministry, his message was this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, he would tell people. Why? Not because he just wanted to stick it to them and tell them how dirty and rotten they were, but he called people to repentance because he was committed to the truth of God and he desired to help people see that the path of sin is a path of destruction. So it was out of compassion. Well, he happened to speak the truth to people who had nothing. But John also spoke the truth to the richest and most powerful people. And it happened to be that he spoke the truth to King Herod who in the circumstance, King Herod, the most, arguably the most powerful uh, man of Jerusalem in that day, of Judea and, and in the region around, who was also a tyrant. I mean, he murdered people uh, if he thought they were gonna try to undermine his authority. He murdered his own children if he thought they were gonna try to take the throne too early. You're just like, what a, what a ruthless guy. That'd be a guy that you might wanna bite your tongue around. But John says, I'm committed to speaking the truth to him. Well, John. Uh, uh, John spoke to King Herod on such an occasion as King Herod uh, was attracted to his brother's wife and saw fit to seduce and marry her. And you don't even have to be a law-abiding Jewish citizen to know that ain't right. You know what I'm saying? Even, even Gentiles go, uh, that's something wrong with that. And there is something wrong with that. Uh, it's wrong, God says it was wrong. 
And John the Baptist said this to Herod. He spoke it openly. He said, this is, it's wrong what you're doing. It is not lawful, it's not pleasing to God. And the path that, that you're walking is a path of destruction. And, and Herod didn't like it, so he put John in prison. Man, would we have the boldness and conviction and courage of John to be able to speak what is true and right, to help people not run headlong and ignorantly into destruction, but to let them know, repent. May God give us that kind of, uh, of conviction, right, amen? No wonder Jesus said of John that he is the greatest born of, born of women. John was a great man, no doubt. But well, here we find John in prison for that very purpose. So would you stand with me? We're going to read six verses out loud and together. I want to encourage you to read with faith, read with joy, read in such a way that the people around you can hear your voice while you at the same time listen to the voices around you speaking, not their words, not my words, not old words from a book, but God's word. We get that privilege today to speak and hear God's word. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's read, starting in verse 1, out loud and together. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Would you pray with me? Father, we open our hearts to your word today, to your spirit today, to your son, Jesus Christ, today. We pray that you would instruct us in what is right and true. That as we hear and, and take heart to the words that are spoken and read before us today, Lord, that we would grow in hunger and in knowledge and experience of who you are. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please have a seat. I'd like to focus in on the question that John asks Jesus. The question that John asks of Jesus. For I believe that it is this question and the answer that Jesus gives to this question that tells us what we need to know. Tells us what we need to know. You know, I've already given you the background of why John was in prison. And on the natural basis, we could rightly understand that John might have some doubts. Uh, John was the very first human being by the way, to recognize Jesus as divine. To recognize Jesus as divine. You say, well, what about those two old people in the temple when Jesus was brought to be dedicated? Didn't they, didn't they beat John to the punch because John didn't say it until Jesus was coming to be baptized? Ooh, but you forget. The John in the womb. John, while still in his mother's womb. The Bible tells us that Mary came to visit Elizabeth, her cousin. Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist. Mary was with child with Jesus. Elizabeth was with child with John. The Holy Spirit had spoken to both sets of parents to tell them of the distinct and, and precious nature of their children. Get this, even before they were conceived. Think of, think of that. Like I know we make a big deal about, you know, life begins at conception, but I'm just here to tell you right now that God places value on life even before that. God's commitment to life is more than biology. God's commitment to life is as the extension of his own personhood. God saw fit to prophesy and speak the, the words of John's life. And, and as John, prenatal John, in the womb, is, encounters Jesus in Mary's womb, the Bible tells us that Elizabeth says the child within her leapt. Woo! By the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. So in that moment, John says, that's Jesus, that's the Messiah, that's the chosen one. So even from in the womb, John was recognizing this. So we know, and, and by the way, even in the natural, as Jesus comes to John many years later to be baptized in the Jordan, John sees him, and what does he say about Jesus as he comes? He says, look, here he comes, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. John recognizes, he says, he is greater than I am. He must increase and I must decrease. 
In fact, it was upon John saying this that some of John's own disciples, men who had committed to following John, learning from John, hearing from him about who God was, when he said this, they left John and they said, well, then we're going to go follow Jesus. If he's greater, we want greater. So John had recognized the Messiahship, if you will, the chosen one before him as Jesus, but you can imagine sitting in prison now, knowing that his expiration date is about to pass. I mean, when you get imprisoned by a maniacal dictator like Herod, you know that your days are not long. You know, when you've told him things that you go, uh, yeah, your wife, that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. He's like, don't you talk about my wife like that. I'm not, t I'm just telling you, it's wrong. When you upset a guy like that, you know your days are numbered. You can imagine as he sits there, thinking about the shortness of his days, but also knowing Jesus, the Messiah, he'd come to take away the sins of the earth. He's gotta have some questions, right? He's thinking, okay, I've recognized Jesus as coming from God. I've recognized him as, as the anointed or the chosen one, as the Christ. But he says, I, but I know what else the Bible says about the anointed one, the chosen one, the Christ. And I'm wondering when I'm gonna see those things. And this is the essence of John's question. His question says, are you the one or is there more to this thing? You know, friends, we know this, that the Messiah, not just from what we read in the book of Acts and what we read in the, in the Gospels, but from what the Old Testament clearly prophesies from Moses on of who the Messiah is, who God's chosen one is, and what he will do. We know, for instance, that the Messiah and everyone who was expectantly awaiting the Messiah knew that the Messiah was the salvation of God. He was the salvation of God for all of God's people, right? This is the Messiah. We know that the Messiah is, is prophesied of as the one who brings healing, who, who does mir miraculous works. We know that the Messiah, as prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures and fulfilled later in the New Testament scriptures, is the one that rightly has the Holy Spirit upon them and, get this, that would pour out that same Holy Spirit on all who would trust in him. So the Messiah, in, in, in the Old Testament method of, of looking at things and in the New Testament fulfillment of that is the, the Savior, is the healer, is the one who re both receives and gives the Holy Spirit to those who follow him. And as well, and we see as a prominent theme in all of the messianic prophecies and scriptures that mes the Messiah and Messiah is the triumphant king who will reign over all of the earth, who will rectify all injustice and will crush to dust all the enemies of God. So we see all of these things, that, that he is the savior, the healer, the spirit baptizer, and the coming king. We see this is the prophecy of Messiah. And when John asks this question, he says, are you the one? Or is there more? Is there more that we should expect? Is there more that's coming? And Jesus' answer, so by, by the way, so John's question implies, John's question implies that there's greater meaning than just, am I gonna get out of prison? It implies a greater expectation because John, by the way, you may not know this about John, but John was, was a devout student of the prophets, was a devout student, somebody who was committed to the word and the ways of God. John knew what the scripture said about the Messiah. So when he asked if Jesus was the Messiah, he wasn't just asking a single question. He was asking this holistic response. Jesus' response to the question May, may, may be missed in its significance by those who would not stop and pay attention to what he says. Because in true Jesus fashion, when he's asked a very specific question that's essentially a yes or no question, are you the one? That's the question, right? So if you're efficient, if you're a Western-minded person and you're just like, okay, what's the answer to the question? Is it A, B, C, or is it, it's a yes or no question. It's like, what do you think? Does Jesus take the maiden answer the yes or no question with a yes or no? In true fashion, no, he doesn't. And in fact, most of Jesus' responses uh, are not yes or no que you know, questions. He, he goes deep, and he unfolds the true questions of the heart. And in this case, it's no different. Here's his answer to the question. Jesus says, go back and tell him what you see and what you hear. You know, it's interesting. These disciples were sent to Jesus with a question, 
and they were sent back with Je from Jesus with a commission to tell what they see and hear. You know, this by definition is what a witness is. A witness in the legal sense and in the spiritual sense is one who tells what they see and what they hear. You know, does the world need faith-filled believers who will witness to those who don't know Christ yet? You're, doing, you're being way too quiet for a Pentecost Sunday. I'm just saying, does the world need believers who are willing to witness, right? Yes, absolutely. Do you ever feel the intimidation to share your faith because of things like, well, I don't know, what if somebody asks me a question I don't know the answer to? Do you ever feel the weight of like, well, I mean, I, I, I don't know how they're gonna respond or I'm not sure what they'll think about that. Like, of course, we all feel that pressure, that intimidation, and, and at times we're like, well, I'm not sure, is this gonna be good? Is it gonna go okay? Am, is, am I risking too much? Is this gonna hurt? Is it gonna, you know, so we withhold. Many times because we lack knowledge and we think that to be a witness means that we need to be an expert witness. We need to be somebody who's got a doctoral degree that we can stand on the stand and we can tell everybody, explain them everything that they need to know. Well, that's only one variety of witness. Friends, the greatest tool that you and I hold in sharing our faith is what we ourselves have seen and what we ourselves have heard. Has Jesus Christ made an impact on your life? Yes or no? Of course he has. Look, you have seen it. You know it. You know, friends, this is the most powerful tool that you have to share with others to, th that brings a compelling reason to consider faith in Christ. You know, it's hard for somebody to argue with your experience. For instance, when you say, wow, we went through this really difficult time, we, this incredible loss in our life, in our family, and you know what, it was terrible and I wouldn't re redo it, but you know, er even during that time, God gave me tremendous peace and just a sense of trusting him, and I knew that things are gonna be okay. Look, I trust God. Nobody can argue and say, no, you don't. You don't have peace. Explain it, prove it to me. Prove, prove it to me that you got peace. You're like, how's this working? Like, That's fake. Look, your experience is exactly what God has given you. You are called to, in the same way, be a witness. Be a witness to share what you have seen and heard. Yes, there is more to share, yes there is knowledge to gain, yes there are compelling arguments to make, but friends, the greatest thing you have is what the Holy Spirit has done in you personally. The greatest thing that you have to share is who Jesus is to you personally. Think about this question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus, period? And what difference has he made in your life? John knew who to expect as the Messiah. He knew what the Bible teaches about Messiah. And so Jesus, Jesus was saying, this is what you can experience. This is what you see in here. And, and as he gives them, he says, go tell what you see in here. And by the way, Jesus tells him, in case you forgot what you've seen and heard, let me remind you. And he tells them this, he says in verse five, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. He's saying, this is what you've seen and what you hear. Now that's a pretty good list of accomplishments, isn't it? That's pretty good uh, evidence of, of a fruitful ministry if all of those things are happening. And you might hear that and go, wow, that's impressive. But friends, there's way more to the equation. Jesus wasn't just giving a list of things that happened last Tuesday. Jesus wasn't just speaking things that have happened during the course of his itinerant ministry. He wasn't just listing miracles. What Jesus was doing, you may have noticed it as we read, if you could bring up that, that portion there uh, of, the, uh, of Matthew chapter 11, there's some portions in there that are in all caps. The New American Standard Bible treats in the New Testament direct quotations of the Old Testament by putting them in all caps. And so you see these words in verse five, the blind receive what? Sight, it's in all caps. Why? Because it is a direct quotation of one of the greatest messianic prophetic scriptures in the Bible. You see further down, the poor have the gospel what? Preached to them. Why is it in all caps? Because it is a direct quotation of one of the greatest messianic prophecies in scripture. And John, as a student of the Messiah, as an eager, expectant, waiting soul for the Messiah, would have known these words, and not just known what these words said, but known what did the rest of that passage say? I wanna read you the rest of the passage. You okay with that? I'm not gonna wait for your response, I'm just gonna do it. 
The first passage that Jesus says, the poor, or the, the blind receive their sight. Did Jesus heal blind people? Yes. Amen, he did. Can Jesus still do that today, by the way? Yes. Absolutely he can. Uh, but this is something that was is prophesied of the ministry of the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 35. Here's what Isaiah 35, I'm gonna read the whole thing without commentary to you, as, as hard as that is gonna be for me to do, I'm just gonna read it to you. What did this passage of scripture that contains this promise of the work of the Messiah also contain? And I want you to pay attention, not just to, oh, where's that verse, but what else does it say about the ministry, the kingdom, and the person of Messiah? It says this, the wilderness and the desert will be glad and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy for waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. What a beautiful passage of scripture. Think of it. Are you the Messiah? Tell them this, Isaiah 35. Now does Isaiah 35 contain the promise of healing? Of course. Does Isaiah 35 contain, wow, a whole lot of the other promises of what we expect from the ministry and coming kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ? about the triumph over evil, about the promise of, of, of a uh, tearless eternity, about the healing of all disease, about the return of Jewish people to their homeland, about the return of all of the ransomed of the Lord who will come with joy and singing. Wow, there is so much in there, stuff that we have seen that Jesus er in his earthly ministry fulfilled and things that we know that Messiah, Jesus Christ, is still in the process of bringing into fulfillment when he returns. So friends, when we see this question of, are you the Messiah, it's not just a small question, am I gonna get out of jail? It is the full picture. Look, Jesus also answered, he says, tell them this, tell them the poor have the gospel preached to them. Are you grateful that the Lord preached the gospel to you when you were in deep spiritual poverty? When you came to that recognition, you said, you know what? I got nothing to save myself, I am lost hopeless in despair that the gospel came to you at such a time when your heart was willing to acknowledge your poverty? Jesus said, this is another indicator that I am the Messiah. Where does this come from? Because it's all caps as well. Friends, this comes from one of the most exciting passages in the, in the book of Isaiah in chapter 61. Isaiah 61, which consequently Jesus himself read aloud from the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue in the city of Nazareth, his own hometown. And as Jesus read, and I will read these words in just a moment, as Jesus read these words, he stopped midway through the second verse, and he says, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. 
And, and then the rest of the chapter is also prophecy of the Messiah. What does it say? Listen to this. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And this is where Jesus stops and says, this has now been fulfilled in your hearing. And yet the passage continues on with promises of the Messiah, which we, t we now can assume are yet fulfilled, but surely will be fulfilled. Here's where he continues. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. But you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land. Everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering and I will faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and as a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. That's a lot. And Jesus' answer to the question, are you the Messiah, was what? Was to quote from two of the most prominent, promising prophecies of who the Messiah was and what the ministry and accomplishment of the Messiah would be. And in one way of speaking, Jesus said, some of these things you see now, they are being fulfilled as I have even said in Nazareth, in your hearing, he says to John's disciples, go tell him these things are happening. The ministry of Messiah, Jesus as the savior and the healer has been kicked off. Jesus, the, Meshu, the uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, the, the Messiah, the savior has begun. And yet by implication, yet by extrapolation of these very same prophecies, we understand that there's more to the Messiah than simply earthly ministry, than just miracles and death. There is a great deal more. In fact, we understand the fullness of Messiah and who he was, that he was indeed savior, that he was indeed healer, as Jesus' earthly ministry showed, but even beyond that, that he is the one who is the recipient the spirit of the lord is upon me and as we see later in scripture and, and actually earlier in joel chapter 2 he, that the that the spirit of that same lord would be poured out on sons and daughters not just on jesus christ the messiah but that the messiah would bring about the pouring out of the holy spirit on all believers this is the role of jesus and yet in that a future yet future component of who the Messiah is, we see the triumphant rule and reign of Jesus as he comes again in his second coming. 
These are all a part of Messiah. And when he answered John, he acknowledged, I am this one. I am this one. There is no other. There is no other. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. This is the same spirit that Jesus would give to his disciples. Now I want to just take a moment here, and as we come to a place, I'd like to come to a place of, of conclusion and response in just a moment. But what, what I'd like to ask you to consider as we think about the role of Messiah, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of believers to acknowledge Messiah and to walk in, the, in, in faith with Messiah, I want you to understand just two ways in which the Bible speaks of believers interacting with the Holy Spirit. I know there is a great deal of conflating the work of the Holy Spirit in, in a number of ways. In some ways, it offends people. You know, right there at the end of Matthew eleven six, 6, Jesus says, blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. You know, unfortunately, there are a lot of opportunities that we will have to take offense at some of the teachings of Jesus, not necessarily because Jesus is offensive. In some ways, he offends our sense of flesh and selfishness and sinfulness, but in other ways, we take offense vicariously at Jesus through maybe poor teaching of others. You know, through maybe others trying to make a point and inadvertently stomping on uh, people's sensitivities. And I think with regards to the Holy Spirit, there's a great deal of misunderstanding. You know, certainly there is a role of the Holy Spirit that we acknowledge on the day of Pentecost that was manifest in those first believers and subsequent believers in gifts like miraculous things like speaking in, in unknown tongues. The Bible talks a great deal about speaking in tongues as a, a sign of the presence of the outpoured Holy Spirit in people's lives. But friends, let's back up a little bit. Because a lot of times people say, whoa, 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 I don't, that makes me uncomfortable, or I'm not sure about that, or I was, I've been told weird things about that. This, listen, can I just tell you the, the two ways, and we need to start with the, the first and most important way in which the Holy Spirit interacts in the lives of people, and that is this is in breathed, in breathed into all who will believe. Can I just say this right now to put you, your heart at a place of comfort and peace through the ministry of Jesus, Messiah, that if you believe in him in this very moment, if you believe in Jesus as Messiah, that you, if you are saved, then you, my friend, are a recipient of the in breathed Holy Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit of God. If you are a believer in Jesus, is that you say amen? If you, are, if you are a believer in Jesus, you have received the Holy Spirit of God. Here's where we see this take place in John chapter 20. Now the purpose of the inbreathed spirit in salvation is to produce a regeneration, a new man, a new woman is birthed inside of us by the working of God's Holy Spirit. You are now regenerate, you are now saved, you have now received the deposit of God's promise. Just right there, cue the sunshine to light up the room. Beautiful. So this inbreathed spirit, we see this, John chapter 20, I'm gonna st read starting in verse 19. This is on Easter resurrection Sunday night. Resurrection takes place, a few of the disciples encounter the risen Lord, they return, Mary Magdalene encounters, she's told to go tell the disciples and Peter what you've seen. Uh, the disciples hear, some of them saw, but they hear, and yet uh, they are now hiding out in a room with locked doors because they're afraid that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. But they shouldn't have been afraid that what happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. They should rejoice that what happened to Jesus, eternal life, was going to happen to them. But anyway, here's what it says in John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, that is Sunday, and when the doors were shut, uh, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in through the shut door, by the way. That's unique. Jesus came in and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. He's showing them his scars. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I sent you. I also send you. And when he had said this, he, he breathed on them and said to them, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. 
receive the Holy Spirit. What's happening here? I'll tell you what's happening here. Salvation. The disciples in this very moment are being regenerated. A new man is being birthed within them by the inbreathed Spirit of God. You see, we're not saved because we make up our mind to be saved. We're saved when we receive the breath of God. The breath of God. Last week we talked from the book of Zechariah. The Lord says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit. And the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which means breath or wind. Well, the according New Testament word for this breath or wind or even the spirit of God is the word pneuma with a P. And it, and it means the same thing. It is the breath of God. As Jesus breathed on them, they received the breath of God and they were regenerated. What does Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tell us about the, what, what is required for salvation? Romans 10 9 says, then if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God what? That God raised him from the dead, then you will be what? Saved. So these two things coming together, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Up to this point, had the disciples confessed that Jesus was their Lord? As they followed him, and what did they call him? Lord. Lord, Jesus. They, they said, we will lay down our lives for you. Jesus, we will follow you. Jesus, where else can we go to find the words of life? The, Jesus was their Lord, undoubtedly. No doubt about it. They had confessed with their mouth. People knew it. People... People hated them because of it. They had confessed with their mouth that Jesus was Lord. But up until this point, I don't believe that they had believed in their heart that God raised him from the dead. Most of them didn't see him raised from the dead, and the ones that did, didn't know what to think. But as he stood before them that evening, that evening, maybe 12 hours later than they saw him earlier that morning, and they, they had no doubt in their hearts or minds, as he spoke to them, as he spoke peace over them, and as he breathed on them, they believed in their heart in that moment. And in that very moment, that belief and confession came together. You see, there's action, there's outward orientated uh, uh, manifestation of what they, what they believed, and there is an inward convincing not based on data or proof or anything, but they just, they knew, they knew. And this is why the Apostle Paul writes later in Romans 10 that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, friends, this is faith. This is what faith is. It is the working together of the action of the mouth and the belief of the heart. And in that moment, salvation occurs. So this is what happens when salvation occurs. The breath of God is now regenerating them. The Spirit, they receive the in-breathed Holy Spirit. Have you believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessed with your mouth that he's Lord? Yes. Then that same in-breathed Spirit is in you. Just rejoice, give thanks to God for that. Thank you, Lord. Being made new. Being made new. So what then is the second function of the Spirit in the life of a believer? Well, if the inbreathed spirit comes at salvation, we read very distinctly and specifically of a subsequent action of the Holy Spirit, subsequent meaning after or at a different, or different uh, uh, time or location, subsequent move of the Holy Spirit, and that is the outpoured spirit, the outpoured spirit. And the in, the inbreathed spirit was for the purpose of regeneration and salvation and the deposit of God's promise, the outpoured spirit is for the purpose of encouragement, of edification, of empowerment, of effectual prayer being given to the believer and a demonstration that the Spirit of God is indeed there. You see, inward is this, the, the work of salvation, but outward is the work of the outpoured Holy Spirit. So you say, well, that, that sounds okay, but what does the Bible say about it? Because that's all I really am concerned with. I mean, there's lots of testimonies and stories and experiences, but friends, does it line up with the scripture? Does it uh, accord to, uh, with what the scripture says? Well, here's what Acts chapter one, Jesus again speaking to his disciples in verse four, and he says this, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. If you've read the, the Gospel of John recently, John chapter 16, Jesus is 
telling them about the Holy Spirit that God is going to give. So you heard this from me, remember? And the disciples are going, oh yeah, we remember. You heard it, wait for it, it's coming. Now keep in mind, who is he speaking to? The disciples. Is this before or after he breathed on them in John chapter 20? It's after. They're saved. They have been given and received the Holy Spirit. But he says, wait, God has more. Wait, God has something for you in verse five. For John, here's what he's telling you. This is what you're waiting for. John baptized with what? Water. But you, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In other words, Jesus was telling them of this outpoured baptism of the Holy Spirit for those who are believers. They have already received the Holy Spirit in them. Now they will be uh, graciously and abundantly poured out upon, and we see it indeed uh, in Acts chapter two. As, as they do obediently go to Jerusalem to wait, as they're gathered together, the Holy Spirit comes into the room, into the place where they're at, and they are, there's, there's a sound of the mighty rushing wind. There is the, what they see as tongues of fire descending upon them, and what they hear, and others hear, as them speaking the language that God empowers them. Not language that they had learned, but language that God had given them the utterance to. And the Bible speaks in many places and times about various functions of that gift of tongues. Some of them functions in a public gathering where a, a word of tongues is accompanied by a word that interprets what is said, not just so that we can go, oh, praise God, they got the Holy Spirit, but so that everybody can go, what in the world does that mean? Because isn't that more important? What does it mean? And that's the gift of interpretation. There are other me mentions of the gift of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer that are not publicly applied, but privately applied. The gift in, in personal prayer, that we intercede, yet not us. The Holy Spirit intercedes through us with groans and utterances that, that we do not con control. Pardon me, not control, but that we do not originate with us. The Bible tells us indeed that speaking in tongues is not like, oh no, I'm possessed and I'm taken over, I'm out of control. The Bible tells us that those who speak in tongues, that the mouth of the one who prophesies in tongues that way is under the control of the one who speaks. It's not an out-of-control experience. It's not an out-of-body experience. It is a willing participation from the speaker who provides the mouth moving and God through his Holy Spirit who provides the words that give animation to that mouth moving. And the speaker can rightly stop speaking. You know this, you, you don't have to speak in tongues. I know I'm an assembly of God preacher and we're supposed to say you have to speak in tongues and if you don't speak in, listen, you don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to, but can I tell you right now, God desires to give you the fullness of his Holy Spirit. Is that your, is that your desire? Look, don't, and I, and I recognize this, especially in these last few years, there's been like, like the church in this greater, you know, east side of Seattle area, it's like somebody picked it up and went, and people fell out of all kinds of churches all over the place. And not everybody here was raised going to a Pentecostal church, an Assembly of God church. And some of you are like, we've been going to this church for six months and I just figured out that this is a weirdo Pentecostal place. <laughs> you know what, that's why you fit in great. I'm just here to say we're not, worship team, why don't you come and join me here. We're not here to elevate doctrine. We're here to elevate Jesus Christ and to acknowledge all that the scriptures say about who he is, about what he does, and what he will fulfill. Amen. Jesus Christ is our savior. Amen. There is no salvation except through Jesus. <laughs> Amen? Jesus Christ is our healer. And I know there'll be some that say, yeah, he did that, but I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still is a healer. Does Jesus heal every time we ask him to? My experience is that he has not healed every time I've prayed for somebody to be healed. In fact, I've actually prayed for people to be healed that then passed away. You probably have had the same experience. You say, what's going on? I don't know all the time, but I'm not God. I just trust God, but I know he's a healer. So don't let 
past apparent disappointments or failures keep you from present pursuit? So if you prayed for people that didn't get healed, raise your hand if you ever prayed for somebody who didn't get healed. Okay, so that's pretty much everybody. If you didn't raise your hand, I wanna to talk to you later. Because <laughs> one of two things are true. You've never prayed for anybody or you're batting a thousand. And I'm hoping for the second one, I'm hoping for that. Listen, just because you've prayed for people that didn't get healed, don't let that stop you from praying for everyone that you encounter. Pray for healing. Jesus is our healer, amen? amen? Jesus is also, as the scriptures foretell and prophesy, the one who pours out the Holy Spirit of God on believers. Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit of God. Later in Acts chapter two, it says, this Jesus God raised up to life again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, has poured forth this which you both see and hear. This is, this is the Apostle Peter's response to, why are you guys all speaking in tongues? Jesus has poured out the Holy Spirit on us. Jesus is the one who not just poured out the Spirit 2,000 years ago, but pours out the Spirit on believers today. He is the one who has breathed the spirit of salvation in, and he is the one who pours the spirit of baptism upon us. It's, it's a part of the Bible. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the beginning to the end, this is who Jesus is. And friends, I tell you right now, Jesus is our, our coming king. Amen. Jesus is the Messiah who will render all injustice rectified. Hallelujah. Jesus is the one who will rule the nations with an iron rod. Jesus is the name that every knee will bow in front of and every tongue will confess. Hallelujah. And yet this, this component of Messiah is future. It's fulfilled because Jesus is done, but we are waiting to see that fulfillment manifest in our lives on the earth, in the new and restored earth. I said earlier that the desire and the prayer that I've gotten cooking in my heart is this, that we would be a hungry people. I know it's almost lunchtime and I'm not trying to mess with your minds or anything, but I'm just saying, you know, Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone when the devil tempted him to make bread after he'd been fasting 40 days and nights, Jesus is like, man, there's, there's something far greater than just food. Jesus was hungry for that spirit of the sovereign Lord to be on him. You know, when Jesus just spoke, spoke with and met with the woman at the well, he sent his disciples to go get lunch. And when they came back, they're like, uh, we brought you lunch. He's like, I already ate. What? He's like, I have food that you don't know about, guys. It's to do the will of God. It's to receive the outpoured spirit of God and to see the miracles take place. That is greater fulfillment than anything that you could imagine on this earth. This is my prayer for you. But that's that style and type of hunger. You're like, I don't know what all that looks like. And frankly, I'm a little uncomfortable with some of the places that might take me. Some of the calls of faith that might call, take me to make, make me to take, whatever you fill it in there. But God, I want you. God, I desire more of you. God, I have received your inbreathed spirit and I, am, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I am made new. And God, I pray now that you would pour out your spirit upon me. Come on in this place, if you're hungry for the Lord, would you just humbly stand to your feet? You're saying, God, I desire that spirit to be poured on me. And without getting hung up or caught up on doctrine or theology or distinctives or outwards, this and that, would you just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, pour your Holy Spirit upon me. I receive your spirit here and now. Father, I want all of what you have for me. I want to live in fullness of Messiah. I want to live in the fulfillment of Jesus, my Savior, Jesus, my healer, Jesus, my spirit baptizer, Jesus, my soon coming King. Hallelujah. Come on, friends, just begin to pray. 
Just begin to speak out. Maybe the Lord puts a word of faith in your heart right now to pray a prayer that you haven't dared to pray. Maybe the Lord is stirring you to speak in words that you don't even know right now. Maybe you've been given that gift of speaking in tongues. Just begin to pray out now. It's not for others to hear. This is that private application. This is that place to not be offended by, but to let the Lord just give you his wonderful blessing, his wonderful gift, the wonderful outpouring of his promise, his promise, his promise. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Friends, in this moment, some of you may want to just step from where you're at and come and kneel here around one of these altars once more in this beautiful service. Maybe it was during communion that you knelt, but maybe the Lord is right now calling you to come. Maybe it's asking Jesus for healing. Maybe it's asking for the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's just seek the Lord for a few moments here. Let's just seek the Lord for a few moments and sing this song of faith and this prayer about inviting the Holy Spirit into our hearts, lives, into our families, into our, our marriages, into our community. Come on, just call out upon the name of the Lord. If you want to lift your hands and sing, if you want to lift your hands and pray, if you want to kneel where you're at or come to the front, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, God. Oh, rashata ramidia kohon barashata. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Lord God, pour out your spirit, I pray. Pour out your spirit, I pray. On old and young, on sons and daughters. Lord, on great and small. Oh, pour out your Holy Spirit, Lord God. May we walk in the fullness of Messiah, fullness of Jesus, fullness of our Savior. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I pray healing. I pray healing would be received in marriages and families right now. Lord, I pray that restoration would be given to hearts that have strayed. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring the hearts of fathers and children together, of, of husbands and wives together, of neighbors together. Oh, surround us. Surround us with your very presence, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. To be overcome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let me give specific encouragement, specifically to those of you who are praying for and seeking that outpoured Holy Spirit. There are times, and I think you could hear testimonies of others and see like we see in scripture, that when that prayer is prayed, something so distinct, something so powerful. In the first service, Sandy shared her testimony of as a young girl, that the Lord just, when she received that gift of the Holy Spirit, she said, I can tell you the seat I was sitting in here in the sanctuary, I can tell you what, where we were, what time of the day it was. And she said, just, I began to pray and the Lord prayed through. And, Without a doubt, right? Without a doubt. That's, that's a moment that you know God heard that prayer. You know, and for, for, for some of you, that may be your story, and that may be the story God's shaping in you even now. I remember my friend Dan Hyatt, who was in the first service, who has served the Lord faithfully, I think, all of his adult life, and maybe even beyond, who desired and prayed for that gift. And it had been many, many years. And I can tell you that this, this Sunday, that he was kneeling at these altars, and just long, long just just sitting in God's presence, worshiping as people were just praying around and people began to peel off and then all of a sudden, man, he, just this sound of joy started coming out of him. He began to pray and he was a mixture of laughing and weeping and language, English and words I never knew. I go, something just happened right there and then. And it had been years in the making. I just, there's a story from a, a, a young mom in our congregation who said, I, I desired that gift of the spirit. I don't know, I've never, heard that it explained in that way and I just I want that and so some friends gathered around and prayed for her and the Lord do that and nothing but she said I, I want that I'm hungry for that and she said she was driving with her kids in the back seat of the minivan buckled up and she's just singing and praising driving down the road and just praying out loud and praising the Lord and all of a sudden something just happened in the minivan in the minivan like I don't know happy meals stuff between the seats all that kind of stuff fruit snacks everywhere all of a sudden she just joy began to come out of her mouth and she began to sing in words that she had never learned before and in that moment God released that and it was in a in a place of it wasn't the pressure of anybody's watching except the kids in the back seat and you know maybe the guy in the car next to and I just say this as an encouragement if you desire 
the Spirit of God to be present in your life. You have the Spirit of God if you're a believer. He is in you. But if you desire that outpouring to show up in your life, in your words, to, that, to empower you, just be hungry. Stay hungry. You say, well, it's never happened. You know what? Be grateful. Not that it hasn't happened, but that you've received the inbreathed spirit. Be grateful for all the wonderful things. The posture of gratitude is a powerful thing in our hearts and lives. It shapes the way we see ourselves and others. It shapes the heart of God towards us. Stay hungry. I just want to encourage you that stay hungry. Stay hungry and may the Spirit of God, who has both been breathed into you, has regenerated you, has made you a new man, a new woman, may the Spirit of God also be poured out on you. What is inside, may it be overflowing everywhere in your words, in your prayers, in your witness. You know, we get hung up on, did you speak in tongues? Did you not speak in tongues? Did you speak in tongues? I, I believe, and I can't see in the Bible the, another evidence, if you will, that says this is what happened when they received the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is normative. In Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 9, in Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 19, it's what happens when the outpoured Spirit, right? So, but I'm just saying right now, what we should want is the Spirit. The Spirit's the one that determines what the Spirit looks like in our lives. The Bible tells us what that looks like, so we're not here to say, mm, no thanks, I don't want that. Who would say that to God? Not one of his children who's been regenerated. So don't be fearful. Don't let maybe what others have demonstrated in the past, you go, uh, I, don't, I don't like that. You know what? It's ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Father to give you the Spirit, and he will. And stay hungry for him for all of your days. And by the way, anybody who thinks, well, I've got the Holy Spirit, so I'm a better Christian than somebody else, the very fact that you think that proves that you're wrong. That's called pride, my friend. And not only is this a good month to repent of pride, but it's a good month to acknowledge what the Bible actually teaches about pride. So it doesn't elevate a believer as a better person or as a better Christian. It's the gift of God. And so I'm just saying, stop letting the devil play mind games with you. Well, you didn't receive the Holy Spirit, so God doesn't, you don't, you're, you're saved. You did receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but you, you know, when you're baptized in the Spirit, that's just probably something, blah, blah, blah. Listen, don't let the devil steal a gift from you or dissuade you from wanting to receive the gift in the first place. So here's the blessing. We're, we're, we're gonna continue to pray and sing, and you know, I'd be happy to pray with anybody who desires to be prayed for, but I just wanna pray our blessing over you. It is 1246. That's when I plan to be done today, I'm pretty sure. What an exciting service. We were just waiting for the the car wash to catch up, so. But may the Lord himself bless you and protect you. May God Almighty smile down upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and may he give you his peace through Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, who is our salvation, who is our healer, who is the one who pours out the Holy Spirit on us, and who is the one whose return we await. In that name, amen. amen. Amen, friends. Continue to pray around this altar. If you can, stop by and see our teen Bible quizzers, either to get your car washed or to simply help them make their way to nationals. We're so grateful that you joined us here today at Cedar Park Church. We know there's a lot of ways that you could be spending your time, but we're thankful that you are here with us. And we pray that it was a meaningful time, that you were encouraged, that you heard from the Lord. That's right. And even though we're separated by time and space, we want you to know that it's important to us that you're with us today. And we're praying for you and believing in God's best for your life. And whether you're watching online because you're traveling or out of town, or maybe you're just checking out church, we would love the opportunity to say hello to you in person soon. So may God bless you and thanks for spending your time with us today.